Welcome to Brevity Box. I'm Charlie. Uh, we're going to try going at this cold Brando, my co-host right here with me. Um, how you doing, man? I'm not doing all right. How about yourself? You nervous? Nah. A little shaky? No? Nah. I don't know. You know, it, we, we talked about it a little bit. We thought maybe this would be better to jump in cold. Uh, kind of give you guys a, uh, an idea of who we are. Um, you know, we, we want to try to put together a, an interesting variety of topics for you guys to talk about. And I think we should just jump right in. Uh, Brando, here is something topical and current. Ruth hey. Bader Ginsburg. Tragic. We're not going to get crazy heavy political, but here's the thought. If you had every, like the pool of voters here, could simply coordinate with each other as groups. Let's get all of the senators and congressmen and campaigns out of the way. You've just got the group that supports one and the group that supports the other, and somehow we're able to communicate. And like fantasy football, I know that's a little light, but check this out. Would you trade, if you could, would you go to that group and say, you know, uh, you can have the Supreme Court, but you can't have Trump. I'll trade you one for the other. We'll vote the people for the Senate that you want to get things to where you can have the Supreme Court you want. Ideological victory for the conservatives. And you think Trump's that big of a threat. You vote to trade that out or vice versa. You say, all right, you can have your president, but we're going to, you know, you, you will make sure that he gets his next four years and you support us having in 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 exchange for our votes for that you give us the votes for the supreme court would you trade one for the other and which way would you go well considering the supreme court has lifetime appointments i think that's the much more important seat to have so you would accept four more years donald trump but you get uh merrick garland on the supreme court see here's here's the thing here's the shitty hot take this is where we get to talk about male privilege. Because oh, okay. Because guess what? If that crazy woman or any any if if they put that crazy woman on the Supreme Court, guess what? As a man, it doesn't really change much for me. But not replacing RBG with someone like minded really sucks for women and future women's rights in this country. Well, in America in general, I mean, I, I agree with that. There are people who won't agree with that, to be fair. I would like to try to make sure that when we talk about those kinds of things that we represent, that it's not that uh, I don't want to I don't want to have a sort of a moral elitism. Right. Like we're talking about it. We have things that we're passionate about. We're opinionated. But uh, I personally I live in the South and uh, I have a lot of people that I've gotten to know that represent that other perspective. And. I think it's better if we just kind of have the ability to talk about these things from that point of view. I'm not saying they're all people I agree with or that there's definitely extremists, but the exercise here is kind of speaks to that, right? Like, I think if you get where it's just the voters that are concerned with those kinds of goals, you'd have a more real conversation and there wouldn't, it wouldn't be so volatile. It wouldn't be those uh, campaigns trying to push uh, each one of those sides so far to the extremes of each side with their rhetoric or with how they position themselves. So, I, you know, it, I just thought it was a good thought experiment and worth kind of moving on to. But that's been on my mind, right? It's been in the news. It's It's been kind of at the forefront. And then, you know, on a totally different note, I, I, I've had it on my main, like the, I've heard the controversy about people getting upset with um and we're not going to go into masks too much but like let's let's change the subject from politics that was a good step but in the nfl you've got coaches who are supposed to be wearing the masks and they're not wearing the masks for a lot of reasons and they're getting fined okay um so i had an interesting take on this first off everybody has their opinion about whether you know whether or not to uh find them or not my perspective on it is, and I want to see if you agree with this, for me, my two contradicting thoughts. One is, obviously, they need to represent not only for the NFL, but for the country. Like, it's a 
it's a great representation of what we should all be doing and they should be doing it. Agreed. Uh, simple terms. It was an agreement that they had put in so that we could have football. And that's about as far as I need it to be in terms of them getting fined. Right. I don't think they're getting fined for a, a morality falter. I think they're getting fined because they kind of made an agreement to do something and they didn't do it. So they're getting fined. You know, whatever that would be for whatever capacity. I don't think it's uh, they're shaming him. I think the NFL wants to represent that this is the healthy way to go. And the coaches are recognizable faces that are on camera. Um, I think the most sensible argument about why it seems ridiculous, though, to be not the mask, not the mask. The the mask seems to be so much more for that symbolism because of the immense amount of effort and extra steps that the NFL has taken to safeguard, to have the players and the coaches wear monitors that let them know if they had come in contact with somebody to test positive, they'll know everybody that came in contact with that person. Uh, they test everybody before they enter the stadium. It would appear that those coaches have already been tested, right? Because everybody around them, the players and everybody else are not wearing the masks. Some of the coaches are. So either the coaches aren't tested and and literally are or, or some you know what I'm saying? It seems more of a we need to represent this because nobody can see those monitors on the wrist and so on and so forth. Right. So the fine yeah. to me is that's where I think the fine is really about them just not doing what the agreement was. Right. That the face of the NFL has to have a mask on it right now, whoever it is. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's 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 a simple thing. People are going to look up to people are going to look up to those coaches. People that look up to them need to see them doing the right thing by putting a mask on. I mean, I have glasses. I hate wearing masks. It annoys the shit out of me. But you know what? I I'm part of the solution. I'm part of the problem. Every time I leave my house, I have a mask on. Well, I think it's just due diligence, and I mean, we can get into that, and I think that's where we can kind of. This is a good moment to say. We know how everybody's passionate about these things. Uh, I'm with you. I think it's more about looking out for the community. I like being a part of a community. I don't mind being a contributor to its safety. Um, what's up? What I mean, look, I don't want to go serious on everything, man. What's what else has been on your mind? Final take on masks. I had a theory about okay. the, about the about the non-mask wearers. I'm Lay pretty on. sure that non-mask wearers, people that are vehemently opposed to them, and people that have halitosis. I'm pretty sure that Venn diagram is just a straight up circle. <laughs> it's just a dot. Yeah. It's just a big dot. You ever put on a yeah. mask before you brush your teeth? You realize, oh, wow, my breath smells like shit. Uh, no. And we know more about your hygiene now. Thank you. Yeah, hey, man. Sometimes some mornings you do what you got to do. You got to know. You got to get out the door. No, you know, it's, it's just one of those things that kind of crosses my mind. You know, I, I think that. It's just been a it's been a crazy year, and I think that that's been a lot of what, you know, all a lot of us are stuck in our homes, and a lot of us have more time to read and consume and try to understand what's going on, and I think that having a sounding board of that stuff is is sort of what I'm going for, you know, it's what I'm trying to work on or what I'm trying to accomplish, um, you know, I want to have fun with it, I want to have some humor. What are you? What's on your goal list here? I mean, we're we're starting off dry. We don't really have a we're trying to purposely not have like a grid format to what we're talking about. I think you got to be outlined by you know what you want to do. I mean, I think we both got into this cuz we always have these conversations anyway. Like, like you said earlier. Digital jazz, man. <laughs> nice callback. But you know, we for Brando and I have been friends for 18 years. 18 years and we've been roommates we've been through thick and thin he's you know stood in my wedding and that that friendship we're a, we're a lot of the uh odd couple traits that you kind of see and that work together i think that was where this idea came from and i think that's part of what i want to get i want to get that back and forth that we have when we're talking about really controversial stuff or really stupid topics or or just things that we're into. I'm totally stoked about the Virtua Fighter announcement. This is going to be a deep well we'll probably touch on a lot of times. But for me, these, it, you know, I'm talking about Ruth Bader Ginsburg one moment. I want to be able to change the subject to talk about 
Cobra Kai on Netflix and how I'm rewatching it. Uh, the Boys and how I can't get enough of it and I wish they weren't doing weekly episodes or, you know, a video game that I'm into. The, that's I just have a wide variety of things I'm into and I want to put it out there. And I think I want you to squash them and tell me how stupid I am and how I'm wasting my time. Yeah, let's talk about the boys and how stupid you are. Okay. I'm here. Considering, I mean, considering the fact that I've spent the last six months pretty much living in my cave of an apartment, working from my dinner table. The COVID. fact that, that show, anyway, hashtag planet COVID, the fact that that show is coming out weekly, it now gives me kind of at least a reason to start looking forward to Thursday nights when it drops for me again. It's, 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 it's just the little things, you know? Yeah. And I mean, it, it, and I, it, it gives me more time to, you know, watch an episode, let it marinate, talk to some friends about it, opposed to just binging the entire thing in one night, because it's kind of what I did with the previous season. So for those people who haven't seen the show, um, the boys is on Amazon. I mean, what's your quick description if you had to describe it to somebody who's never seen it? Well, first of all, I'm I'm kind of ashamed to admit that I've never been more attracted to a crazy fascist, racist, murderous woman. A smoke show. I mean, look. Total total smoke show. Total smoke show. No, Why I mean, do we like a... mean ones? I don't know. Like I said, we'll talk about my we'll talk about last night off the podcast. Um <laughs> Um, I lost my train of thought. I think the Boys. best way I could describe that show to someone who hasn't watched it is it's basically what if the Justice League was corporate owned slash mandated and they were all pricks or just really damaged, messed up people. The best thing I had read was that Homelander was uh, so basically the show The Boys is. Uh, clearly a a um, surrealist take on what superheroes would actually be like as people if they were real in the world. And uh, it, they, they presuppose a sort of Disney-like company that's in control of these um, uh, intellectual properties because they end up making shows and they use them as these big props and, and uh, as a way to market and they make a lot of money doing it and these superheroes are are really amalgams of uh, other characters that you'd be more familiar with so their character homelander who's draped in an american flag uh you know uh phil he looks like a a mash between superman and captain america without the shield and um he looks like he's being he looks like master race superman basically uh, yeah, and and the thing about these characters, they all have really deep personality disorders, and uh, how that kind of that they there's some really hard, gruesome, brutal scenes, but it 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 sort of takes the piss out of it because there's a group, the boys, that for their own reasons in the story are trying to you know take down the company that supports them and trying to take down the heroes themselves. And the show has got this quality to it that's really smart and funny. Um, it's hard not to get addicted to, man. Very hard. Now, have you – you should check it out if you don't uh, already know what this is. It's uh, on Amazon Prime. It's uh, got a whole season out there. There's seven episodes in the second season. If you want to poke fun at everything you've seen over the last 10 years from Marvel and DC and you kind of want to take the steam out of it and – and see what happens there. I think you'll you'll have a lot of fun. I I think everybody's watching these things because they're locked inside. Are you are you sick of the streaming services? Are you getting to a point where you're just ready to turn off the TV and go outside? Well, I I think my well, first of all, I think my main reason for enjoying that show so much is I'm just so sick of Marvel movies. Well, that's kind of my point, right? The yeah. boys is for the, for that fatigue from yeah. yeah superhero fatigue. And look, don't get me wrong. If they make a Deadpool 3, I'll go see it. But otherwise, comic movies are pretty much dead to me. I just can't do it anymore. Yeah, I, I'm addicted. I love them. I, I'll play yeah. the games. I, I I think they're great. You know, I, I get the point, though. I like all of it. I like, the, I like the creativity and the imagination of it, really. We know you've been scared watching horror movies by yourself. Well, now you don't have to. Hang out with Ruminations of Red Rum. All things horror, from movies to the latest spooky games we've played. Come hang out. But hurry. The killer's behind you!
as as for the streaming services, I mean, they've definitely helped out. There's too damn many of them now. I mean, I get HBO now for free through uh, through AT and T with my cell phone plan, thankfully. Been meaning to sit down and watch Love Lovecraft Country. Um, I I I you, Graham, Sharon, and my dad use my Netflix account more than I do. Shh. He, he, you know, yeah, come on, man. <laughs> you oh, want me to give know. everybody your passcode? They yeah, know. I, know I know they know. I know they know. And I, thankfully, I mean, you know, you think when you pay 40 bucks a month for Hulu with live TV that 40 bucks would get you ad free on demand shows? No, it really doesn't. Thankfully, I'm leeching off my dad's account in exchange for being family tech support. So at least I'm not paying for that. But well, it's, he, how I, he, it's how I get my news, at least. Yeah, but you know what's funny about that is I was thinking it really has become where they're making more money by not selling you like sling maybe is the most sensible, but it's now everybody's so proprietary. You have to have NBC's app to do certain NBC shows. You have to have Disney's app. You're, you're going to be paying for these things and you're going to end up. I mean, you, it got to where we don't have just one cable provider, right? Yeah. You've got one Avenue to plug it in, but you've got a bunch of different things you're paying. And because it's not all on one bill, I think people end up paying more in some cases. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. And it's just going to get worse, right? Because, I mean, now it's going to be all exclusivity. Netflix producing. I mean, some of it's good. Some of it's fluff. Some of it's not good. Apparently, whatever executive Netflix greenlit acquiring in that movie, Cutie's really fucked up. Well, that's a whole story we should dive into at another time for sure. But uh, you know, dude, like this is a crazy thing in general. Let's let's kind of move past what we're talking about. We get carried away and talk about anything for a long time. But what do you think about the opportunity, man? I mean, I mean, obviously, if you look at the fact that there's thousands upon thousands of podcasts out there, it just seemed like a good time to add another one, right? Yeah, definitely. The world doesn't have but, enough. But it's interesting. I don't know that. Um, you know, I I I'm a fan. I mean, what are your what are your three or four favorite podcasts besides besides the uh, uh, unmentioned for our guest? What would you oh, say top four oh, besides the, ruminations for the uh, from the red room? What would you say? Are aside your three from or four? anything, aside from anything on this network, one of the things that's really kept me going and kept me entertained throughout the pandy. Is definitely, like your mom, definitely, definitely your mom's house. Thank you, Santino. Andrew Santino, the pandy. Your mom's house, Tom Segura and his comedian wife. Just, uh, YMH. They just, find, they just find horrible clips from the internet to, you know, laugh and comment on. And sometimes it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest, it's a, it, it's a massively acquired taste. And the totally, un, completely uncensored live shows they've done recently because they can't do stand up right now. Uh, those will change a man, not for and, and, and not in a good way. It is a it is the traveling freak show from the early 1900s, man. That is it, that, it, that, that's perfect. You know what I mean? Like it, that's kind of the role I think they play. And if you haven't checked it out, I mean they're just incredibly. They don't need me to promote them. I'm a nobody, uh, but they're incredibly talented comedians. Uh, Tom Segura is. I saw him live in Tucson. I've never seen a bad show from uh from him and him and his wife Christina Pazinski did i say that correctly yeah you know, they're both super hilarious they both do really well it's you'll they have a series of different shows but so YMH obviously i think you're going to go straight to do you do a do you do Dr Drew after dark as well it depends on who's co-hosting it with him if it's Christina I, gotcha. I don't bother because she thinks that being in therapy for like 13 years has made her into a semi-qualified therapist, and I'm not about Criticism. that. Criticism. <laughs> but, you know, if Potter the Cockroach or Tom Segura is the co-host, especially if Tom Segura is the one sitting in the other chair, I know Dr. Drew's about to be tortured emotionally. Yeah, for sure. He's going to be taken to the the the, sh- the shed. Um, How about, like, uh, do you have anything contradictory to that, or is it all comedy? Like yeah, I have NPR, I'm not ashamed. I have I have the NPR politics podcast I listen to. Oh, NPR, wait, wait, don't tell me every week. Come on. Yeah, it's amazing that Paula Poundstone is so funny on that show, but her stand-up comedy was terrible. 
I don't know, man. I think she was funny for when she was. You know what I mean? Like, it's just now. To be fair, I mean, that's kind of before my time. But And then uh, number two that I listen to probably the most often is, you know, without trying to sound like a fucking basic bro here, is probably the Rogan podcast, depending on the guest. I don't give a damn Grand about Dr. him. Rogan. I don't give a damn about him waxing poetic with other stand-up comedians about the art of stand-up comedy, or you're a fool if you go into a cubicle and work a job. You should. I, I don't know. But for example, his uh, his most recent podcast episode with Edward Snowden, very educational, also very terrifying. Right. And then if you know he's got like Joey Diaz or the aforementioned Tom Segura on there, oh, I'll clear my schedule and listen to that. Well, I mean, look, everybody knows who Joe Rogan is, and um, it makes sense that you bring him up. It, you know, whatever moron from, thinks he should host a presidential debate should be slapped upside their head. It depends, right? Like, I think enter- if you're just looking at it from entertainment value, it would be it would be an amazing entertainment value. Like, if let me put it this way: if they had the debate, this, this is not the year for entertainment. That's, that's not the year, right? I don't I don't know that it would sub be a substantive substantive i don't know what that word is i don't think it would have any impact i think it would be ridiculed and i think it'd be more about the back and forth plus i really do think that that i mean if you listen to joe rogan enough he's got his views on the presidency and whatnot and i think that that would work out where uh, maybe him and and uh the current president would be riffing really well and biden would seem like the odd man out and i don't know if that would be anything about you know, you know what I mean. Like that's not about we, what the. We, we don't need riffing with the moderator. We need the moderator that's what I'm to keep keep things in line, keep them on time, and call well, bullshit. Well, I'm I'm happy with Chris Wallace, but l- oh yeah, let let me. You know, you talk about Joe Rogan, and I think it's probably a great moment or a good moment for me to just say that that's a clearly probably half of all podcasts out there are inspired by Joe Rogan. And half of all podcasts out there are, are, are more. I'm just pulling that straight out of my keister. He is a workhorse. He's interesting. And the thing I like about that person that inspires me is his natural curiosity. And I don't think that that's something that you find very many places. And it's a good way for us to talk about why, you know, how we're even doing this. Um, Brevity Box. Do I not get is... my third podcast choice? I'm jumping right ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Third podcast choice. Rude bastard. I, can, I, I, I cannot <laughs> recommend enough Dan Carlin's Hardcore History. That being oh, that's said, go favorites. ahead and do your, do your little jump. Go ahead. Pod Save America. I think Pod Save America is a classic. Yeah, but I listen less and less now because I just need a break from the news cycle more often than not. My dad wrote a porno is a good one. Sorry, That's really what? funny. Uh, they did a show on HBO too. It's called my my dad wrote a porno, and it's just a hilarious. Um, think think um, more in the kind of line of humor as Flight of the Concords. But you oh, should definitely oh. check that out. Anyway, I I have been a listener of a lot of different podcasts like you. Uh, clearly, YMH, your mom's house is in there. Um, Drew, uh, Le- Dr. Drew's podcast with Christina or with Tom or anybody else. I just think that's a great show. Bad Friends. Uh, I love Andrew Santino. Um, there's a lot out there. And I, I think when you feel like you can relate to somebody who has that natural curiosity and you're given an opportunity to just try it out, <laughs> YMH joke, and we got that chance. And, um, you know, I, I talk about Joe Rogan being inspirational because of that disposition. You know, um, our guest today, our first guest, honestly, and makes a lot of sense, uh, is got a lot of those similar traits. And even though his podcast is uh, one that we haven't mentioned yet, it's definitely one that we've been a part of in the past and we've listened to religiously. Um, you know, Mitch Proctor and Ruminations from the Red Room have been instrumental in putting together a collaboration that I think you cannot, I can't talk about it enough that it's just exciting to be able to do um, 
anything like this. And it wouldn't be here if it weren't for Mitch. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it gives Brevity Box, which, you know, we try to stick with uh, making sure you know where you're a part of it. Our, we're Brevity Box Podcast, uh, organic, fresh brewed ruminations. We're trying to be able to reflect on a lot of different things. And Mitch has put together a network of great minds and interesting um, podcasts that we're just going to try to get off the ground with the Ruminations Radio Network. And it's, you know, for me, it's it's focused on what's inspirational about, you know, Joe Rogan and his natural curiosity, his willingness to do it. Mitch has been doing his podcast now for a few years. He's got incredible hosting skills. I can't wait to dig into who the man is, but I want to be able to talk about this network because of what it is right now. And yeah, we've got our show and we could spend a lot of time talking about Brevity Box, but this network is, you know, put together with a few interesting different niches. Did you, you have one that stands out to you, man? I mean, the one that gets me is Ruminations of Red Rum, which, I mean, if you're oh, a that's fan. The one of, I'm looking, that's what I'm looking forward to a lot. I'm excited about the, it's, a, you know, you're going to have a, a lifelong fan of scary, uh, and horror movies, thrillers, the exploration into each uh, title by title. I can't wait to see that show take off, you know, along with retro futurist culture. I mean, that one, it, it's going to go into areas of anime and sci-fi imagination that I, you know, again, diversity perspective i mean you got fiction from tony's tall tales you got a psychological bent looking at the human experiment with mike you got ruminations of a six button samurai which i promise you initially it, it it's hard to i honestly made the mistake of thinking it was all about fight games which i uh i love so that is but, exactly what i thought when i saw this i love it but man when you see the way that the host explores the impact and role that not only games, but the environment that games uh, provided, you know, whether that was an arcade, depending on how old you are when you were a kid and sort of the role it played in your life and, and where you went with things. I think it's just a really, you know, this is a group of people with really interesting concepts, you know, and, and it's a, it's incredible to be a part of it, you know, and Mitch is, the reason we're a part of it uh ruminations radio network is his baby and um we're gonna you know we thought it was appropriate to have him on as a guest i mean you're part of this too man what do, what do you feel you think excited i'm i'm i don't know if i'm already boring you talking so much i feel like i have a need to talk too much i mean you always talk too much it's th th there's a reason why that it's probably better to do a podcast with us kind of talking about these things because i mean i gotta schedule your phone calls anyways to make sure i got like an hour and a half clear i'm just excited i mean to me i, I look at the list of raw the roster here right the roster yeah. on this network at the jump is mitch's show ruminations from the red room on the human experiment record store ruminations which we hadn't mentioned yet if you have ever been a collector of vinyl or you know somebody who's a collector of vinyl records and uh, or maybe you're just a fan of John Cusack movies and great amazing music references in Oh my John god, Cusack. I knew you'd make a high fidelity reference right there. I'm trying not to go straight with high fidelity. You said it for me, so thank you. Uh, look, one of the examples I got from this host's scope is you know, he talked about finding um, vinyl and records that had been used at radio stations with, you know, notes like production notes on the songs that they played and when they played them. And it, you know, that gives you a timestamp. The way that he's going to extrapolate all these interesting perspectives from vinyl that's going to give you a, uh, a, like a, a soundtrack to this journey into these random memories that maybe we're just getting a chance to peep into. That's a really cool concept, and it's something that speaks to. I mean, look, we bonded on music when we first met. Yeah, 
I I'm interested to see kind of that that range like what's the range of this man's vinyl collection and where he's going to go and I can imagine the guests he's going to have on it's going to be about exploring what that music means to them with anything with any of these topics I think that's where it's going to be about so you know we have ruminations from the red room on the human experiment record store ruminations ruminations of six button samurai brevity box us ruminations of red rum retro futurist culture and ruminations on Tony's Tall Tales, which Anthony is uh, a talented writer, and this is going to be about, you know, the stories really taking the stage. And honestly, I, I'm a I'm a movie fan. I I know you read a lot. You like to read a lot of novels. My wife does the same. I think having something where we can just put it on and be taken on a journey on us for that kind of fiction is. It's going to be a great thing to have on and have in your head, and you can get them all at one place. So that's why we're doing it. That's what we're a part of. And, and I think plus, that's all you, and plus, as all you other office drones out there know, podcasts are what get us through the week. Yeah, yeah. You you listen. You're you're our voice to the people, Brando, to tell them this is what they need to listen to. And it's, I think it's a you know going on this journey with us while we figure this out and kind of get our our feel for it and hopefully it'll be something you want to keep listening to um, as long as my coworkers don't listen to it because i got a certain bad bitch reputation i got to maintain around that place <laughs> you're you I, well look i can attest mm-hmm. uh mm-hmm. i know nobody can see it but you've got a fierce resting bitch face brando it is fantastic it's fantastic mm-hmm. so look i think um I don't I, I want to be careful not to sound like i'm i'm polishing uh too hard but look Mitch, as a uh, individual, has got a lot of stories, and I've reached out to friends of his for a long time. And when it comes to uh, testaments of character, he's a great friend. He's incredibly supportive. I think he's, I mean, clearly a big inspiration. And I think that that's why all of us not only are excited for our own reasons, but we're, we're just very ready to be a part of this uh, this idea birth straight from the man's mind and i think it's a great one and i think it was appropriate to make sure that he was the first guest and we focus on you know i want to know why he did it i mean i want to ask him questions about his his inspirations and whatnot what do you what are you thinking you're going to try to get out of mitch well again i mean in a world so saturated with podcasts it's I just want to know what his inspiration was and uh i also talk a bit about the, in case people don't know, the origin of the original name of his show, which possibly not a lot of younger people are going to get. And, uh, you know, I got some, definitely some other things I want to talk about. Maybe some suggestions for Mitch, things we could possibly do as a, as a network, maybe kind of feel it out on air. You never know. Well, I think, Mitch, you know, Mitch I want to... Mitch, Mitch is a great guy, and I was introduced to him through one of our mutual favorite people in the world. Mr. Dave Martinez, may you, uh, may you rest yeah. in peace, friend. Listen, that is a great reference and definitely fond memory of, of Dave. Uh, you know, that we're going to definitely touch on a few of those things. Um, I think, I think for me, I just want to get down to what inspired him to start the podcast of his own in the first place. I, I'd like to know what it's been like to keep it going for so many years. Maybe the lessons he's learned from the time he started to uh, the way he goes about his practice now, you know, and and just the I have a lot of uh, respect for how his work ethic. I mean, his work ethic to play out to put this together and and you know, kind of rally the team in a lot of cases. It's it's he's just an interesting guy. And I'm proud to be a part of the collaboration with him. And I, I think I, I think you guys listening or listener, hopefully listeners, I think you're going to find it interesting, too. And uh, I don't think there's a better way to, to start off our, our, our initial podcast and even this whole endeavor than by putting a spotlight on uh, really, if you narrow it down to the one person who's responsible for it all, it's, it's Mitch Proctor. And uh, I think that. I think it's a good thing. I think we're we're doing it right. Absolutely. And what I definitely want to ask him about is how he educated himself to a point where he could gear up the legitimate podcast studio 
that he had when he lived here in the Dirty Tea. The first time I saw that, that was a that was a pretty impressive setup. Well, and and look, let's talk about the roots too. I mean, this is this is uh the the quintessential you know last Coca Cola in the desert kind of thing. I mean, he's from the White Mountains. He's every bit the outdoorsman and and he's got that same natural curiosity that i find inspiring about you know joe rogan if you listen to any of mitch's podcasts you get right away that he is just uh, a comforting conversationalist and curious about people like a genuinely curious about the world around him and i it's something that i think I've, i i connect with him on. i think everybody connects with him on quite honestly no matter who i'm listening to him talk to it's always warm it's just you know uh, we're going to make sure he gets voted for president. We're talking him up a little too much, probably. So I think we should go ahead and just welcome him to the show and uh, get him in here, unless you have something else you might want to throw in there before we just go ahead and make the introduction, Brando. I'd like to think President Mitch could definitely get Black Label Society to play at his inauguration. I don't think anybody would tell him to stop using their music. But enough of that. We're going <laughs> to <we're gonna> dive <laughs> So uh, Mitch look. is smart enough to know why, as a politician, you don't use "Fortunate Son" or "Born in the USA" as rally music or campaign music. We'll definitely be asking him about that. But you know, look, let's let's uh, we're gonna figure this out as we go. We're gonna get uh, you know our our chops down. I think that this is a good opening step for us, a good practice or a good episode one. Uh, and people, I thank you for giving us a chance to get in your head for a little bit and stick with us, you know, be a part of this and see where we go. Brando, what do you, what do you want for it? What do you think? I'm looking forward to making you play a game next time that I have created. Uh, I'm not looking forward to your harassment that I know is going to come from this. And it's not uh, harassment. Uh, it, it, look, I'm sure it'll be enjoyable either way. I, I, I'm sure I'll get over it and the scars will heal and I'll feel okay about it in the end. Mm-hmm. But you say that now, but I say that now. I'll complain a lot of before. But look, we'll save a lot more conversation for episode two. We thank you for listening to this. We're going to move on and welcome our guest. Uh, if you're there by yourself, you can clap. Otherwise, uh, please welcome the RRN de facto CEO and a host of Ruminations from the Red Room, Mitch Proctor. Brevity Box is a production of Ruminations Radio Network. If you enjoyed this podcast and want to find some more great content by passionate creators, please visit us at ruminationsradionetwork.com or anywhere you find great podcasts. And don't forget to please rate, review, and subscribe. Welcome back to Brevity Vox. We're here with our very first guest, Mitch. Welcome. Man, the myth, the legend. Welcome to our, uh, our, our Enola Gay flight, man. <laughs> I mean, seriously. It's exciting to have you. I know that this, like you said, you're uncomfortable a little bit. Uh, you're the one who's usually the host, and you're giving me the opportunity to be uh, the host and to grill you. And finally, I get some sweet, sweet revenge. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was going to come back to kick me in the ass. No, that's great. You were not supposed to like let let know to the audience that uh, that I was uncomfortable. That was that was uh, to be a good thing. That- you know, I, I appreciate your advice to some extent, but you know, you're going to have to let me have my own way here, okay, Mitch. Okay. It's not all about your way of doing things. <laughs> Do you really I'm want to call our first man. podcast the Enola Gay episode? That's kind of dark. No, I don't. I was a okay. reference okay. pulled from my keister. Okay, so. Moving on, Mitch, we, uh, Brando and I, obviously very excited to be able to, you know, hone our skills and, and get, get ourselves, uh, acclimated to this new world and environment. We spent a lot of time really, uh, excited and describing what it is you've put together here, but I think we take a second and tell people who you are, obviously, sure. uh, you know, well, let's start from where you're from originally. Where'd you grow up, Mitch? I grew up in northern Arizona, um, a little small town called St. John's, until I was nine. Then I moved to Hawaii and wow. spent my formative years in Hawaii and then came back here to go to school. 
Do you think the I mean, we talk about Arizona. I love Arizona. I lived in Arizona for a long time. It's where I met you and we put things together. Uh, what do you think played the biggest role in molding your perception of the world? Because you seem like a standout guy, right? You're a host of your own show that's been going on for how long? Ruminations of the Red Room has been going on for how long now? Three years. I mean, three years, your, your musical tastes are diverse. You're really dug in. What makes you, what's the big influence there? Was it Hawaii? That seems to, that sounds like the obvious curveball, right? You <laughs> moved to Hawaii and everybody's going to intuitively say it was Hawaii. Was it Hawaii? Or do you think uh, our love affair with Arizona is really kind of where it's all at? No, I absolutely love Arizona. And without that foundation that started there and the way that I was raised in the small town that I was uh, lucky enough to grow up in, if, without, without that, then the Hawaii ingredient wouldn't have made as big an impact. But absolutely, Hawaii was formative in uh, opening my eyes and bringing light to new things. And then uh, I love Tucson. So once I came back from Hawaii, I moved to Tucson for uh, for school. And that that was a big deal, too, getting out of the, the small town thing. Even in Hawaii, I was kind of living in one of the smaller towns on Maui. But uh, yeah, that's where I learned to love metal and kind of <laughs> everything kind of yeah. there, honestly you know i think that's it's interesting but your love affair with metal has been a lifelong romance how much do you think you do you think you'll be one of those 75 year old dudes still rocking fingers in the air if i make 75 damn straight i will be you're gonna be like christopher <laughs> lee and put out a gothic metal album or whatever that was like a month before you die Yes. Yes. It, it like, it, it like what? Ninety years old. Cheers to Saint Lee. Absolutely. Cheers to Saint Lee. Out of all that time, you know, the thing I did a little homework. You know, I talked to, uh, and we'll get into the network and the people involved. But you know, I've always looked at myself, and um, one of the things that makes me really uh, proud is my relationships that I have with my friends, and I care about my mm -hmm. friends, and I invest in those friendships. And I don't come across too many people who I can just easily recognize that they're the same way and getting to talk to some of your friends and not just the obvious ones like Mike, but <laughs> Anthony and, uh, you know, some of the other collaborators here, man, you have a, a deep history and a reputation, you know, and I mean, talk about for a second, what, is it your upbringing, do you think, that creates that foundation where you're serious about your relationships that you build and you invest in them clearly? So uh, the stories I keep hearing are about you investing in your friendships, of you having a, a clear uh, a code that you are very serious about. What – I mean, did you – did you is that born out of uh, uh, chaos when you were a kid, man, or is that something that – like what motivated that? Like, are you gonna tell me it was metal? It was all metal. It was, it was all, all the, the music. It was the metal, man. The metal does does everything. It it really puts the uh, the spring in your step. You know, the bounce in your uh, <laughs> the hop. I don't know. Uh, yeah, definitely the small town thing uh, made a big difference. My dad, the the example that he set whenever we went anywhere as I was a kid, uh, I worked with him in construction when I was a small child, and then even when I was in high school, and the relationships that I saw him cultivate with other contractors or with even his own workers. Um, he was very, very well respected. And anywhere you went, uh, you know, if I were to say like, oh, I'm, I'm George Proctor's kid, it, it carried a certain amount of, of weight. And my dad wasn't a rich man. He wasn't like a powerful man or anything, but he was respected and he treated people with respect. He was unendingly generous. And uh, he is kind of the role model for my entire life. And so it started there. And when, you know, I'm, I'm really flattered, man. I can, I'm, I thank you very much for those compliments and, you know, cultivating friendships is what I'm, I mean, I don't really understand what else we're here to do except to cultivate relationships and, and do things for other people. And, and that's kind of the measurement of, I don't know, I don't want to say it's the measurement of a man because, you know, I, well, first of all, that sounds sexist, but obviously I don't mean a man, but like I clearly we understand you're a misogynist. Yes, I, I am uh, guilty of that. <laughs> yes, terribly. <laughs> no, I, I get what you're saying though, because I kind—I mean, look, I, I say that from a place of um, I, 
I don't want to say empathy. That's not the right word. I just, I'm parallel to that same kind of mentality. And for me, uh, I, you know, I've, I'm at an age where I look back and I realize that a lot of that was built out of things that I didn't have. Uh, you know, I didn't have that kind of strong relationship with a, a paternal figure. So would you say it was your dad? Like, was George the 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 man who instilled the the value of friendships and relationships to you yeah without even saying as much just it was what i what i saw what i watched happen um just around me with and why he was so revered like why he was so regarded when you said he was you were his kid well i'm sorry like you said when you mentioned that you were uh oh yeah yeah yeah. that 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 was it was noted i was like wow like that means something and so I mean, obviously I didn't always make my dad happy. He, you know, he wasn't real fond of the fact that I played in a rock band and wore makeup. And <laughs> I, I remember one time he, he came, he walked by my room and I just got done with a show and he just stopped and he stood there and he's looking at me and I'm unpacking my gear. And he said, son, are you wearing makeup? <laughs> I, said, I said, yeah. And he just stood there another beat and then just walked away. And I was like, well, okay, that's, I guess that's the extent of that. So, I mean, you know what, though? <laughs> considering, right? Considering that's, that's damn near okay, right? That's damn near with him going like almost like a, if we, you don't talk about it, I won't say anything. Kind of <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. I'm just, just going to walk away. Yeah. So did he, uh, I mean, did, I mean, let's did face have... fathers from our generation probably aren't going to give any overt acceptance of their sons wearing makeup. The, the silent acknowledgement and moving on is probably the best you could have gotten. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, what did your dad say to you, Brando, the first time he caught you in makeup? I mean, what was that, like a week or two ago? I don't remember. I just woke up with bruises. <laughs> <laughs> now that's worth investigating, I'm sure. Um, so did did he, did your dad also, I mean, like, is that where, would you say that that's sort of a cornerstone of, of a lot of different features about you? Did yeah. he have love, a love affair with music that that built your your foundations of, of yeah, like rock and roll, classic rock and roll. Yeah. He introduced me to a lot of the music that was the foundation for everything that came later. Uh, if I hadn't been listening to uh, Jimi Hendrix on our reel to reel when I was six years old, wow. you know, I probably wouldn't have been as open to the metal as I was, but um, he loved music. He sang all the time. He had a beautiful voice and his, his father did not encourage him to, pursue music he he told me very he told me a lot of times about how he wanted to play violin as a kid and his father did not support that and my father never once uh missed an opportunity to, to encourage me in my music that's beautiful man that's that's amazing so is did he also in instill that curiosity about uh just the world around you not just people because clearly uh, the other thing I notice about the people that you keep, the family you've made for yourself, is they're again something I really relate to. Is they're a cast of very <laughs> different, very uh, individually talented people, and and none of them are pushovers. Yeah, you know, and uh, and you know, I mean, is that all instilled from from your? I mean, it sounds like your amazing and great father. Is that from him too? I imagine. Yeah, he was, he was constantly asking, you know, he, he was a voracious reader and, and, you know, we'd go and we'd spend hours in, you know, the bookstores and things. And he'd always encourage me to walk the, watch these documentaries with him. Of course, when you're a kid, you're not aware enough to recognize the value sometimes in those moments, but yeah, he act, absolutely installed that. I mean, he was not a judgmental uh, or prejudiced person, uh, you know, so I, similar to he cultivated a wide variety of relationships and friends and people from all walks of life, because I don't see the point in, you know, differentiate. Yeah. Li- why limit yourself? No, I, I listen, might contribute uh, to your life and how you might contribute to theirs. So was, where was he from? Was he from like Arizona life or old school? I mean, yeah, he was born in New Mexico. Um, and uh, he was, he actually uh, went to high school in our, rival town from my high school in, in round valley springerville st uh, mcmanorberry yeah Mc- <laughs> yeah <laughs> so my mother married uh someone from her rival high school which was pretty oh, you know, unheard of unheard of in the day yeah <laughs> wow now so this is all leading up to you know you're you're talking about how old were you when your dad sees you 
uh, taking off your makeup. <laughs> uh, 16, 17 years old, maybe. If you if you're looking back at that guy now, what do you think he would say to you? Which one? Who? Me at sixteen? The guy. The guy. The, yeah, you. You sixteen. You're you're taking off the makeup. You just got out of just uh-huh. jamming. Like what 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 does that guy see? To me, he yeah. Well, dude, to you right now. That. <laughs> that's what all of us are saying to all of us, right? How does that sound? Uh, but Charlie, didn't you have a very similar experience with your mother at a communards music video? Yeah, that's a great uh, and embarrassing. Okay, so it's not as endearing at all. Okay, so Mitch, uh, let me give you the the fractured uh, urban version of your beautiful story. I was uh, at home. I was a latchkey kid, and my mom comes home how, and catches how old, me. How, how old at this point? About 13, maybe 14 years old. (laughs) And uh, so that puts it right around the 88, 89 era. And uh, I am watching Club MTV. (laughs) (laughs) And they are like premiering a a song by the Communards. And this is a a falsetto voiced uh, cover of Never Gonna Say Goodbye by the Jackson five, but in this very British new wave, uh, and very clearly, um, you know, my, at that time you would have just said very, very gay, right. (laughs) Very clearly proud anthem. And at 13, the sensibilities I had about music were, and to this day are really about, yeah, about beat and hooks and, and samples and, and so, you know, my mother walks in the door. My mother's very conservative. And uh, so she walks in and I'm at my happiest. I'm dancing around the living room, much like I do today. Uh, witness, Brando, you, you've you seen me do this. And it's the communards. And you can see the, the look of sheer concern about... M- my my you know, whatever I might grow into from my very conservative mother. So that that was my version of uh the the endearing moment that Brando brought up to shame me. Thank you, Brando. You're the best. <laughs> Kiss noise. All right. <laughs> so you know, Mitch, uh, we obviously you know we want to know how did you get like what what. What inter- what interviewers, I guess, what journalists, what uh, inspired you to just want to birth your podcast? Like, what makes you go to a podcast? And what what were you watching? Or was there something you watched as a kid? Was there something your dad liked that sort of... No, this one's actually kind of just on my own, you know, journey. He wasn't particularly, you know, nothing like that that he, I can recall. Uh, but... When I was in fourth and fifth grade, my buddy back then, uh, his to protect the innocent, we'll call him Jimmy. But uh, he he and I used to sit down and record on cassette tapes our own little radio show. Uh, we called it Joke Radio. I can't remember what the initial stood for, but it was like Jerks of Kihei Elementary, I think, because we were in, that was in Kihei Elementary School in on Maui. Wow. And, and that was like the first of that, and then the love of the music drove me to of course create that as well. So the podcast was just another form of expression and, and really I think born out of one of my favorite pastimes of, you know, I love cooking outside. I love gathering people together. I love sitting around the fire and talking. And I thought, well, what a great, uh, you know, Avenue, what a great forum to sit and chat with my buddies and just, you know, make something out of it and just, you know, that was really about it. I, I don't remember exactly. I, I'm sure that it was a, it was Kevin Smith. It was the, probably the first podcast I ever listened to something of his. And I was like, well, that's, that's easy. And, and in this instance, I didn't have to teach anybody how to play an instrument. I just had to have a conversation with the people I already loved. So it was really easy and natural. So Kevin Smith, would you would probably list that as your, your biggest motivation pre, pre uh, ruminations red room. We're doing it, yeah, because I mean, his uh, original Smodcast uh, that he does with Scott Mosier yeah, uh, is still one of my favorites. Just so and conversational. 
he's so um he's such a magnetic and likable yeah it's host. it's I mean, impossible not to yeah it's impossible not to i kind I mean, of any person way. that joins the protest line for their own movie is a pretty likable guy yeah <laughs> <laughs> that, that was for dogma right yeah that was for dogma yeah that's genius Actually, much, now how much i got a question for you because i mean look the three of us right now we're just doing this over a an online program that's kind of making it easy for us due to geographical differences. But I was a, a guest in the Red Room a couple of times when you had your your studio here in Tucson, and you had a pretty legit set. So about how, when did it go from just something you wanted to try to do to actually learning about the gear and gearing the hell up for it? Because once again, really impressive setup you had, blew me away. Oh, thanks, man. Uh, that is another one of those just kind of side effects of being in bands my whole life. I have always had a lot of sound equipment in the first place. And uh, with the digital revolution that is like um, like logic and things like that, I already had that stuff set up. And then uh, similar to kind of stumbling into DJing, my cousin asked me, hey, man, will you DJ my wedding? I was like, dude, I'm not a DJ. He's like, yeah, but you got all the gear. I'm like, well, yeah, like 90 percent of it that I would need. So, yeah, sure. Um, I, I guess right. so. So that kind of just happened, and the same thing with the Plus, podcast. most DJs now are just weirdos with MacBooks, so how hard could it be? <laughs> I was like, all you got to do is press play, right? I can do that, which yeah, is exactly. not, it's not that. I thought it was, but it's, it's not, not that. that. No, I, not yeah, that. I'm with you. <laughs> um, and so with the podcasting, man, I was like, you know what? I've I've got a, a, a pretty solid start, so why not just go you know, all the way and just make it nice? If you're going to do something, do it as best as you can, I guess. Did you like? Have you always been pretty confident in your interpersonal like communication skills? I mean, you you on one to one conversation or in small groups are really your conversation skills are just amazing. You're I mean, and it's it's represented. Well, I mean, I'm 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 being fair. All right. I mean, look, I, I've listened to several of you. Your podcasts have been on a couple, and I mean, I'm a fan. First and foremost. I'm a fan and I'm a fan because of the way you can hold a conversation because of the way you direct a conversation. And I think that has a lot to do with that natural curiosity that I think makes you so likable and warm, so. you know? So, um, I think that's why I'm asking all these questions about yeah. sort of, you know, what, what motivates that. And I, and I relate to you. Like when you said you like nothing more than, you know, cooking out on a grill and having people over and that oh. is, and that's a huge part of what has brought uh, so many of my friends close to me and Brando also one of them. I really relate to that. Um, so side note, what is your go-to dish to prepare that you enjoy making, that you love for yourself, you <laughs> feel really confident about it? What's your go-to meal? Oh, no way. Man. Throw, throw, that, throw down a little recipe here. What's your go-to thing? Uh, I... I don't know that I have one, man. I just, I'd, I'd love making stuff on a big griddle um, more than like barbecuing on the grill. Yeah. Um, okay. Like I love making breakfast foods. So probably crepes. I love making oh. crepes because they're so, yeah. so flexible. You know, I prefer the savory. Natalie pre prefers the sweet so we can kind of build our own, but I just, I just enjoy that. Cause then I love making all the filling too. So that's fun. I yeah. Say, I recently had a, uh, a culinary revelation when I learned how much better it is to make chicken when you butterfly it first. I had no idea. Sounds Cut like out that spine, crack that breastbone, lay it flat, put it in the oven, cooks in a fraction of the time. Hmm. And if you do it on a grill, it cooks much more evenly, fraction of the time. <laughs> here's the, here's, I, here's, you, here's it, the trick. Here's, here, here's the money shot. <laughs> <laughs> you lay that thing skin side down on a hot cast iron pan, throw it in the oven for a bit, flip it over for the last 10 minutes, you get nice crispy skin, juicy everything else. All about a cast iron, yeah. This I've is written, what's funny I, to I, me. I, I, I'm, I'm basically a graduate of the Culinary Academy of YouTube, so I am quite the authority on things like that. <laughs> yeah, you let us talk for too long. We'll get into a bunch of different recipes, mm -hmm. man. We, we, are, we end up sounding like a sewing circle at the end of the day sometimes, and we're just... Oh, you got to send me that recipe. Natalie calls that bitch and bitch. 
a what? A stitch and bitch where you get like together and you sew or you stitch or you do like cro- crochet and you sit around and you chat and talk. She calls it a stitch and bitch. That's fantastic. Yeah. Hey, that's pretty great. And one I'm going to have to steal. Well, it's time to think, talk, Mitch. I got to know how, I mean, what with everything going on, you know, this is a weird time to start something. I think it's a great time. Yeah. I want you to talk, I want you to talk about what this means to you. You know, I mean, we we're happy to call this our first episode and you're our first guest and you are the founder of the Ruminations Radio Network. And uh, it's a collaboration that Brando and I are a part of and we I mean, it's impressive, man. And I think I'm not going to be shy about it. You know, the the whole point of wanting to to talk to you is really to kind of show off the inspiration here. You know, and and I mean that. You know, you say I was saying nice words to you about you, but uh, totally my way. I went to the other hosts and saw. I asked them if they could uh, share some some details about why they would be inspired oh, That's by Mitch that Proctor. Yeah, you should. I totally that. did. And uh, but I'm I'm not gonna go crazy and make you trade like very uh, super uncomfortable or anything. But I will say, these are not my stories about you know Mitch you. You have, or, or you mean a lot to these guys. Thanks. You mean a lot to me, but you know, I mean Anthony in particular. Uh, you know, let's. I mean, we can talk about. I think we'll probably talk about every uh, show that's involved with the network. But yeah, let's, these are your pop those guys. Are your friends. Yeah, I th- I'd, I'd like to. I'd like to, and I think I'd like to start with with well Anthony. But you know, he was really sentimental about talking about you know how he met you. Uh, yeah, how he when he was working at uh, was it Robinson's May? Yeah, <laughs> and he's wandering the mall and he's talking about your you know your enlightening him on different games and things he should play. But he also talked about a, a legendary party that I have to know about, <laughs> where you know you <laughs> stock the bar uh-huh. and it I mean to the point where he was talking that this was a party that people remembered for a long time. And it was a, a special memory. I won't give all details away. I I want to hear your your take on this. Do you know what he's referencing? I might. Mitch, I mean, Mitch, Mitch, sure. Mitch, don't feel like you have to speak. A statute of limitations haven't passed yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's Actually, true. it has that. But I mean, there were a few, so it could have been any number of of them. Uh, I so I really don't know. I mean, it could be the time when he was bartending. Yes, uh, that he went to bartending school. Yeah, that was awesome. And I mean, he he actually. I I spent a lot of years, and I know I like, talk about you know the the sex, drugs, and rock and roll, but mine was just the rock and roll for a lot of years because that's that's where my focus was. So I didn't really start drinking until later in uh, my years. And when he started going to bartending school, and uh, I think at the time we were already roommates uh, after having met and become close friends. Uh, that's that's when kind of the training wheels came off. And yeah, there was a a picture somewhere where we had loaded another buddy's ex- explorer from bottom to ceiling, just loaded with with alcohol, and we stocked that bar just just really really full. And it was a it was a lot of fun. It was I don't know what story he told you from that evening, but there are probably a few. I don't know, <laughs> but I think he was just referencing you know the character man. I mean, you've got outstanding character, and I, I'm really pulling that out a lot because I think that's a lot of why we're all here. You know, well, we I mean, all, you know, <laughs> well, I mean, that was, you know, I loved, I like to, I like to host and I hate to reference. Well, I don't hate to reference and I'm just going to own it. Uh, yeah. In friends, there's a, uh, the character Monica. Yeah. Said, I'm, I'm always the host. That was like one of the lines she had, you know, that she, yeah. you know, goes, man, but I, I'm the host. I love to host. I love to have people over, love to show them a good time. There was this big billboard in Tucson forever that said, uh, love people, make them tasty food. And yeah, I don't even remember what that was for, but I was like, I just take that to heart. And uh, yeah, we had a, we had a great time. I'm sure Hoptimus was at that party too. He could tell you stories about the kiddie pool full of beers. Oh wow, you know another another. I mean, the thing is, I'm getting a chance to meet some of the kiddie pool full of beers. Just sounds so wonderfully Tucson. It's very Tucson. It was fantastic. I I I relate to that man. You know, for me, uh, uh, my family hails from uh, around the south, New Orleans being a big part of that, and. It's always how we, uh, it's our coping mechanism, you know, 
we we were able to get through tough times because we always ate well and we always ate well because we put a lot of effort and and uh you know time into cooking good meals and i think uh you know that sort of played its way out for for me you know anytime things got tough or anytime uh i really just needed to have that i prefer that kind of social hour sure. where i have like you i like to be the host and make be make everybody food and have them come over it was always a big deal for me too again when we have a chance we have to really go at mike for i i starting to get an idea <laughs> that uh mike another one of the hosts for the network he uh he's he's human kept us away. he has 100 percent kept us away from each other because he wanted a bigger menu he just wanted to be able to go back and forth to these places to separate parties and, you know, just enjoy everything he could. could it sounds a little bit like something he would do. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, so let, go ahead, go please. Ahead. No, no, um, no, 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 please. please. I appreciate it. I, before you go on, because um, yeah. before you say anything else that's nice that I'm going to have to, you know, uh, blush and put my hand up to my face for that you can't see. <laughs> or you can, because I think I left it on. I can see it. You guys yeah. can't see it. I'm on a, on a, shit. Hi, I, I turned off my camera and I've been just watching the waveforms. See, still think I'm the host. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you need to stop for a moment and also recognize the role that you, Charlie, have played in this. Like your support th- for the Red Room and your support for Ruminations. And, you know, you you constantly supported and encouraged me to, to take a stab at it. And, you know recognizing that and and helping support that decision to move forward and, and being kind of this great um, fire that, that when I was doubting it, you would reignite and help. It, you, you really need to stop and, and uh, recognize that as well. And I think that needs to be said. It can't be said, this couldn't have happened without your encouragement. I probably would have just gone on just doing the Red Room, which is great fun and I love it but I love to see what you guys are all going to do more than you being guests on my show. I, I love to see what you guys are going to do. So that's all you, man. That's it's been your encouragement has really helped a lot. All right. So my first timestamp note from 2815 to 2928, we got to cut that whole bit out. <laughs> uh, I, got, I got the keys to the editing room, bro. So yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, look, wow, uh, an vast yeah. difference to quote the great Marshawn Lynch. I'm just here. So I don't get fined. <laughs> That's right, damn it. Now, you know, Mitch, you're giving yourself a, a huge uh, compliment because honestly, man, it, it speaks to what I'm trying to get across with uh, this this specific podcast is that uh, I don't – I I talk about – I'll talk about my own uh, – what did I say? I'll toot my own horn, right? A lot of people won't toot their own horn. Brando will tell you he gets sick of me tooting my own horn. Uh, <laughs> for anybody out there that's seen the episode of King of the Hill where – where Dale gets his own like super short wave AM radio network and does like a 72 hour conspiracy <laughs> broadcast. That's basically Charlie unfiltered with nobody to keep him in check. <laughs> yeah. That's why, that's why Brando's here to make sure that, uh, keep me in line. But look, I, I honestly don't, um, I motivated, be, you know, I wanted to speak up because I, I mean, truly man, you inspire me and I'm not going to throw that to you at you too, too hard. I just think, you know, I can tell by the friends you keep. I can tell by the way that you you do your business, man. And um, I, I really want to be a part of – I want to collaborate with you on anything. So the encouragement is really representative of what I think of you. And I think that, you know, you, you just backed into a compliment for yourself again. I was going to say, Brando, interrupt him. Come on, isn't that yeah. – <laughs> That's what he's supposed to be doing, right? Yeah. Come on. Probably just Where's let it button? flow. You sound like you're trying to get into his pants. I, and he could. Uh, I mean, you know, if, if there was someone that could. <laughs> no, you know, uh, I mean, look, I, I pointed out I want to get to the meat yeah. of the network, Um, you know. I just – I'm really excited about it. I think that's all we're really talking about, Mitch, and I'm I'm – I'm proud to be by your side on it. Um, I want to talk about these shows because I really think in the end, it speaks to how interesting you are as an individual, not, not so much the content, the content is of the creator, but the creators themselves are your, a collection of your close friends uh, of which I'm going out on a limb and calling myself one of. So, you know, you've got, I mean, it's it's diverse, and I want to talk about them. So, Ruminations Radio Network, 
we have the domain, the website, www.ruminationsradionetwork.com. There will be a collection of all the different shows, and I think we should go through them, man. I mean, do you have one sure. that you're specifically just uh, you're frightened by? Are you nervous about any of them? Are you <laughs> super excited? No, like, no, I'm super excited about all of them. I'm not nervous about any of them. Uh, I was uh, talking about the uh, social media plans the other day, and someone asked me, he's like, well, are you are you confident? that you won't have to police that. I mean, cause you got to protect the brand. Right. And you know, I was like, Hey, I guess you're right. But I thought about it and you know, it, it didn't occur to me because of, of all the guys that are involved, all the people that are going to be and have access to that. I'm, I'm not afraid. I'm not concerned that someone's going to put anything out there. That's going to be detrimental to the endeavor itself. So, I mean, I'm, I'm really thrilled. Like I could I mean, yeah. just name the one. I'll tell you what I'm thrilled about. I mean, well, look, I, I, I mean, will. That, 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 that could have been a risk with me. But I stopped drinking this year, so a longer an issue. Good. Uh, yeah, I'll argue with that. Big risk, huge risk. Okay, so, uh, Mitch, uh, I, I mean, I'm excited about them. I want to go through them one by one. I, I, you talked about social media outreach. I wanted to point out that it's because all these different guys are like, we're all lieutenants, man. Like we're not. <laughs> yeah. It's not a. It's not something where there's a. Uh, you know, some odd, I'm at the top of some pyramid kind of thing. It, that's the beauty of it. This has really been a great beginning for a, a really exciting collaboration. So, mm-hmm. you know, obviously I got your show at the top. It's been there for three years. It's an amazing foundation for us to build off of. I think we can start anywhere. Let's start with something I talked about with Brando a little bit. And he pulled out the high fidelity reference because it, it's just a no brainer, but record store ruminations is a good place to start. We talked yeah. about being DJs. We talked about, you know, the importance of music. Um, again, this is not about me. We'll get there with me at some other point, but I, I me, the me, example me, me, I me. gave, I mean, the example I gave earlier was the same one that uh, was given to us about finding gold in in uh you know secondhand vinyl and and the example of having a note written on the vinyl of a song that was played at a radio station and yeah. giving it a, a virtual time stamp. i mean that's right up my alley <laughs> you know like i, I want to know more i want to hear oh, more about man that. yeah you're gonna love it i'm excited about it so i mean tell us more man i mean what do you Let's so, start with Record Store Ruminations. Yeah, Give Record Store Ruminations. Uh, Ken, he's a great guy that I met through uh, through work uh, back in Tucson. And if I were to say uh, someone epitom- epitomizes, someone who is the epitome of cool, like Ken is cool. My man is like just unflappable and solid. He's the guy you'd like really want to have your back, like in a fight, mostly because he would just laugh and like talk the other guy down and nothing would happen because he's just cool. Like everything just rolls off his back and his music taste is just unassailable. Like it's just awesome. He's, he's, he's a wonderful guy. He's got that Sam Elliott sort of smooth. Oh, roll, smooth. Roll. Sh- oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he totally does. So uh, yeah, his, his is going to be great. What I really get, what, what excites me about his too is, is that it's a big part of his relationship with his wife you know, they'll get a bunch of drinks in them, and then they'll go online and just start buying records. <laughs> I just, I thought that that's really fun. That's going to be a cool thing to be a part of. And I think, you know, his, his perception of a guest coming in and what they're going to bring to any given song, even if it's a song they've never heard or a, mm-hmm. a, a, something they've never even uh, consumed before, that reaction is going to be worth getting and being part of and seeing, or if they have a sentimental story or some history with it, I think there's, it's such a brilliant approach. And I, I, I mean, I, of course I went straight high fidelity with Brando earlier and uh, it's no brainer. You know, I was basically saying if, if you're, if you're a, if you're into any of that, he thinks he's the John Cuse like of that movie, but he's really the Jack Black. Look, I'll take the, in the Jack Black. That's fine. Uh, yeah. You guys are going to love the first episode that uh, we cut. I don't know what his uh, first uh, episode outside of his introductory episode was, but I don't know if you guys already heard, but I inherited five big boxes of vinyl from my grandfather and my uncle. And I have heard that, and I can't wait. 
So we were flipping through that and, and calling out artists and talking about, you know, these different, you know, albums that meant something like, Oh, look at this one that was in there. And it's just, it's really great. And I think the audience is going to have a great time just listening and, and going on that adventure with us. And I expect that it'll be very similar when he releases some of the episodes of him, you know, spending time browsing the local record shops. I can't wait to, to hear what he's got to say. Yeah, I'm, vinyl I'm, is I think is something I think I could really go off go off the deep end on, which is why I just don't do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, but you know what's interesting about that is I think a lot of people might be intimidated to because they they might maybe they feel like it's they don't know something they're supposed to know. I I think that's kind of if you love music, this is going to be a place where you can answer a question: Why is vinyl better? <laughs> and this is and this is somebody who will answer that question in depth. Yeah, and, you because know, and give you like the end of conversation. The undeniable. Yeah, <laughs> in yeah. Land. yeah, but I would encourage anyone to listen to it, even if, even because he's going to be able to explain that in a way that is not condescending or you know in in any way kind of like this. It's not an elitist cast. It's coming from a place of love, and I just I think that's going to bring a lot of people in. Would you say that that's sort of a common thread with all of these guys? I don't think anybody's uh, punching down. No, no. I mean, that's what yeah, I, you know what I mean. Like, it doesn't I, seem like any of them have that that mood in them. They seem like I'm straight here for solid guys. Yeah, with the exception of Brando, maybe not Brando, and probably Arvig. Oh, definitely, definitely, not definitely Arvig. Arvig. <laughs> all right, so that that's a fair segue. That's a fair segue. Our boy, Mister A, Arvig. On the human experiment, I'm excited for him, man. And I think uh, the work that he sounds like he's putting into it, and and the concept. I mean, he is he's invested. Oh, it's it's really impressive, and and we got little glimpses of the t- kind of work he puts in um, for research and some of the episodes we did about sad songs from the Red Room. You know, he he would dive you know deep on some of those artists, and now he's going to have all that time to research and dive in on the topics that he really is passionate about. So that one is something to look forward to for sure. Well, and you know, I I want a video cast out of him because I want to see the dictomy of him talking about deep philosophical things like that in front of his knife wall. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) An existential podcast whose merch is weapons to kill other men. (laughs) Brought to you by today's sponsor, Benchmade. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> you know uh, mike's been a friend of mine for a long time and uh, the uh, i i know that it's a topic that he's passionate about mm-hmm. you know i know that he's he's ready to scratch the surface on anything that has to do with uh you know uh, not only psychology but pathologies and i think the whole beauty of it is that you're gonna be on that journey with somebody who's passionate about it. It might be a common thing here with all of them, right? You're going to get to go on into somebody's mind on things that they're passionate about. So when, when Mike puts forth the question of, you know, uh, he's exploring what it means to be an American or something along the lines of some of these concepts, you know, I don't know if I could, I don't know very many people I would trust and want to hear more from about that unless somebody was really (laughs) into it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Which is exciting for me. I, I can't wait to hear the I'd first to, episode. I'd love to hear huh? Mike break down something. I'd love to hear Mike break down something. I don't think a lot of people really get or understand these days. The difference between patriotism and nationalism. Oh, I'm well, sure I think, he can hit on a lot of that stuff. Yeah, I think he's going to definitely touch on that. Um, you know, one of the... It's interesting because one of the things that I think... Um, talking about Mike, I know I'm going to segue from different podcasts randomly, but... I can't think about Mike without thinking about – I can't think about you, Mitch, or Mike without thinking about Dave Martinez. I can't think about Dave Martinez without thinking about Virtua Fighter. Yeah. And I I, I just – you know, um, I, I won't go too deep. Obviously, I don't want to take that hard of a left turn. But needless to say, you know, these friendships that we have for something that Mitch – that ties you, uh, Arvig, uh, myself, and – the late great Martinez is a awesome fighting game bigger than a game. I, I, we're happened to be talking 
uh, right at the precipice of an announcement of Sega rebirthing this game. You can't even with, hide your joy. You can't even. I'm so excited. Oh, giddy. Can you? I, I, I'm going pro. Once, I'll say it again. 2020 ain't over yet. Don't get your hopes up till it's in your hands. You know, don't bust my bubble yet, bruh. All right. I'm excited. Yeah, we're excited. Virtual Fighter is a, a big, big deal. And it's been on my mind. And listen, uh, Again, though, again, Martinez, who we will go into more detail about, amazing friend. Again, those same qualities, though, kind, uh, courageous, somebody who invested in his friendships, a pure joy to be around. And would we would just always get into not only just games, but we're going to talk about fighting games. And the only reason I brought into fighting games is because of the name of this next podcast. And I'm going to segue that hard to it. Because I love this name. I, I I love saying this name. And I'm jealous <laughs> of this name. I'm I'm not I'm full disclosure when the first time I read it, my envy was through the roof. Because I just thought, how can I, I think that should have retired the rumination word. I mean, it's so damn good. Ruminations of a six button samurai. I wanna buy the book. I wanna buy the shirt. I, I mean, I love it, man. And I get the I, coffee mug. Yeah, that's a bigger. Yeah, the merch. I am the first customer for the merch. Give me the coffee mug. I want it. I love. I love the name. You got to be as excited about it as I am. But the thing is that when again hearing, hearing him talk about it himself, tell us more about the host. Tell us more about the concept. The concept is much bigger than what the name might initially spark in your yeah. mind it is so much bigger i don't think that any of us are going to do justice to it nearly as well as when he gave us his pitch in our first meeting uh about these these casts that we're putting together but the six button samurai coming from my buddy james who i've known 20 years maybe a little more somewhere in that neighborhood who i met at a, a local bookstore that also trafficked in uh our common uh addiction the games and just struck up a friendship. We we spent many nights playing things like Halo and Street Fighter, and he's like getting all the the guys together and playing these games. And the man has a passion that is pretty much unmatched by anyone I know about anything he gets into, and he doesn't ever stop just voraciously consuming more and more information about the things that he loves. And he is so knowledgeable and so daring and bold. He's you know gone out there. He's worked uh, with. Um, the late night Conan guy, uh, Conan O'Brien. He's done a lot of work uh, wow. in New York and out in Cali and stuff. But what really makes this guy stand out is his incredible ability to tie those things to the to the human experience, to the to biographical. So what I understand, and, and he will have to forgive me, the audience will have to forgive me for butchering his uh, description of his podcast. The Six Button Samurai is going to essentially be the story of arcades and gaming with a biographical backdrop. Like it's basically told against the, the biography, the, the, the world, the culture that is happening around individuals as they grow up with these games and, and how they affected you and, and what they meant yeah. to you. But biographically too, like where were you in your life at this time? And, Oh man, I'm just, I'm he, just, I'm God, look, he sweet talked me right into being i mean like i i miss i misunderstood just reading the name and then hearing him talk about yeah i think the words the sentence that really stuck out to me was the role that the arcade played in at that moment where you were at in your life yeah and, and immediately i'm thinking of uh being in an arcade uh, i i think when we were on that conversation we were talking about um warrior needs food gauntlet yeah yeah, yeah well, you know, i remember like i just i remember being uh that was my happy place yeah for so long i loved being at tilt or i loved being at oh uh, my god just saying tilt really took me back wow yeah man and and the same thing what was the one uh game works my god i i remember uh they opened a game works in dallas and I could not be more excited. And it was 45 minutes away. And I, I would just find a way to get to GameWorks so that I could spend $5 playing Virtua Fighter 
two, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, and it's, um, it's a beautiful concept, man. Like it's an amazing concept. It's and I really like, like a review fun. of the games or, or like this is the technology behind it or something. It's, it's the human element that is going to really hit home. That's exciting. I mean, that's the part that got me. I, I think all of these shows have that, but being the the fight gamer and wanting to know more, I mean, mm-hmm. it, and it touches on for a lot of people. I'm sure all of us that are involved here, but man, that the role that the arcade played <laughs> in your life when you were, you know, that that really said a lot to me, and I can't wait to hear him go from there and what he's going to do. Uh, so, passion about that. We're going to move on to the next show and I think it makes sense to go ruminations of red rum. <laughs> I think this guy is so damn cool. Like I saw what he put together just on that clip that he put forth. I mean, I love so many different, I mean, just that conversation of what our favorite scary movies were, mm-hmm. the, the variety of names that came out of that. A lot of John yeah, Carpenter, a lot of John Carpenter fans amongst us. A lot of John Carpenter. Yeah. Can't, how could it not be? Yeah. So this guy is actually probably um, next to, to Ken, um, the the friend in the group, the the guy that I've probably known the shortest amount of time. Um, we only go back a few years. It's really amazing sometimes how people can connect you know, and you never know where that's going to come from or how it's going to happen. And, and I feel uh, like really actually pretty close. I'm very much like a brother that I think is just part of that, in, that incredible dynamic. And he is another guy who's got this incredible sense of humor, just really in yeah. touch with what's going on out there right now, especially with the, again, a little bit younger crowd because he's, you know, probably young enough to be my, my son, but <laughs> he's, Oh, sh- 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 let's not go there right now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but uh, he, he is like a, a, a huge fan of all things horror. And I really, really love his creativity. Like we've done a few, like when we were living together, um, if you're not catching that theme yet, Charlie Huckham, we never lived together. Yeah, we we're getting close. I mean, Brando and I lived together for yeah. sure. <laughs> but uh, he made some little Probably videos. Something else we can blame Mike for. Yeah, something else. Uh, he just he would just make little videos to like send to friends or to like a girl he was dating of like silly shit, like him just throwing away some garbage, like throwing, like tossing a sandwich in the trash can. And I was just kind of amazed and enthralled by this guy who was like making videos of really random shit, but he'd cut them together really well and do some great edits. And it was just a lot of fun. And he was also another guy that was really excited about being part of the podcast and just being a guest. And uh, I just thought it was a perfect and natural fit that he do one and uh, it's going to be cool because he's got a couple co-hosts on there that are interesting and they've got a lot of good things to say. And I think that that spread between he and those couple guys uh, and girls are, is going to be well, really cool. This is another couple that can, that does this together. They're both fans mm-hmm. and that they're both fans of, of horror and thriller, right? His, his girlfriend. Yeah. She's a fan, but she's not the one that's going to be co-hosting on there with him. It's okay, another okay. kind of his and she's, she's really cool. And uh, another long time, like an older friend of his that's going to be on there as well. But I can't wait to see what they do. They're already, uh, the the ideas and the the banter that's going on in their Discord is just, it's a hilarious and it's a hoot. And they've got, they're really shooting to try and become uh, tomatoes certified. So I'm excited for them there. I I really hope they do it. Well, and just content alone, the amount of, of, opinion i mean the, somebody who knows and is a fan of the genre much like we're talking about with all of these things here's somebody who's going to go in a direction and deeper about the topic and the subject matter than uh, any fair weather fan and it's going to make the show i mean i can't wait man i mean i'm seriously yeah. excited about every single one of them and that one uh admittedly uh super stoked about record store ruminations i'm super stoked about all of them i feel connect thing is in hearing everybody talk about it when you can find something that you connect to personally that is part of their focus, that's unusual. Mm-hmm. And that's sort of the common theme other than everybody living together, clearly. <laughs> yeah. So let, let's, uh, let's see if uh, we, we referenced uh, Anthony earlier. Did you live with Anthony too? Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we, got, we got a theme going. So, yeah. Let's talk about uh, 
ruminations on Tony's tall tales. Yes. He's a multifaceted jack of all trades guy, a Renaissance oh, yeah. man. I mean, he is a writer, actor. Uh, he's developing, and I mean, has have has been has his short stories and some of his narrative work has that been? Uh, how you know? Have you seen a lot of that? Are you excited about what he's what he's putting together? I mean, what give us more? I'm really excited about it because I think that he's coming at it from a very uh, a really great point of view, like everybody else's as well. But you know, his experiences out in Hollywood and and the things that he's had to to do and to get work and and the man is just he's hard as steel. Like that's not an easy industry. You know, that's not a, a an easy ride. And for him to you know continue to fight his way through it and into it is just really impressive of you know of his metal, M E T T L E. Yeah, well, no, like oh, I, 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 <laughs> I uh, he seems like someone who has a really healthy self esteem, like a really, he comes off as somebody who's um, self assured and accepting of criticism, and that's not something that's easy to do if you're insecure. No, and he's lovable, you know, you just can't help, and he's got a. I know it's not going to be on the podcast, but you know, maybe we'll have to do some video podcasts with him because the man's got a smile that'll light up a room. You just, it's infectious. His energy just cannot be matched. And his cast is going to be a thrill, man. I can't wait. Cause I'm, I'm hoping, and I, I'm not going to make any promises for him, obviously, but I'm hoping some of his content uh, that he's working on will make its way to the website and maybe actually narrated on his podcast. Cause it's going to be kind of a journal of his journey uh, as a writer uh, you know, working now out there and I would love to see some of it, you know, and obviously he's got to keep it kind of close to the vest because you don't want any of it stolen, et cetera. But I'm hoping right. to see some of it on the, on the, on the site. I, I, I completely uh, shamelessly reached out to him in private and told him that I, at some point, 20 years from now, when he doesn't <laughs> have a million things going on, I'll tell him my secret uh, Virtua Fighter screenplay idea that I've been carrying around with me since I was like, you know, 20. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so we, we've made a tentative appointment for a 2040 meeting to go over it. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> that's great. Well, hey, you guys, can, you guys can do lunch. I, I mean, look, he's on the boulevard. The times I've had a chance to talk to him, man. He's just, we've both ended up smiling and laughing a lot. He's a, He's a really cool guy that I'm looking forward to getting to know more. Really, well, cool, cool. Yeah, and I, I'm I'm excited. I hope his content does make that. Um, so let's move on. I don't want to leave. You know, I'm not going to talk about my podcast because if you're listening, you're listening to it right now, and you sort of get what it's about. What are we listening to, Charlie? You are listening to this Brevity is Brevity Box. Box. <laughs> Organic, fresh brew ruminations of all sorts and flavors. And I am your host, Charlie, and my host over there, partner in crime, is lifelong friend, Brando. We're here to put Mitch on the spotlight today. We got one more show to talk about, and one that I think is, you know, I had a hard time initially explaining this to my wife, but that's because she doesn't have any way to understand intuitively what is involved just in the title i think but when i talking about but when i talked to her brother who is right there with me and his love of so many things in anime for me obviously generationally i was uh much more in that akira ninja scroll please please uh, please akira akira i'm sorry pardon my mispronunciation sword master brando so you know i i just felt like i immediately got the reference and i think it would do some good to talk about our boy Optimus, who yes i have to say in terms of really good voices we're just going to talk about the guy's voice okay let's talk the about guy's it. got an amazing voice truly clear well-spoken He's got that cadence to him. I almost expect him to break into like Luther Vandross, right? <laughs> that, that's that tune, the musicality to the way he speaks. I think it's going to be an entertaining show. Name of the show, Retro Futurist Culture. I mean, 
what a cool set of uh, words that's to, sexy. to put together, man. <laughs> Again, I want the mug. I want the shirt. I want the hat. You know, I'm that honest. I was, I was not surprised, but blown away all at the same time. It was perfect. Perfect. And I mean, it just like hearing, hearing the discussion of the different like movies references. What, I mean, what are you expecting? What are you excited about? What do you think it's going to come down to? Me, myself? Yeah. I think that it's going it, to, uh, you know, it's got such a wide swath to cut through so much media, but I think the, uh, what it's going to come down to is what kind of what you're describing. I mean, this host, he's got, again, one of these guys who's got a wealth of knowledge. It's going to be a great introduction and it's going to kind of explain a lot to a lot of people. They're going to this for those who, who may not pick it up organically. If you get an opportunity to drop this podcast on someone else, I think it's going to open their eyes to a lot of the influences that they're living with daily that they didn't even realize. And well, whether it's games or movies, right? Well, like that, all kinds of things. That's what I'm saying. Like it becomes increasingly intuitive when you really start, going through the references you, you you don't know what to plug into that mm-hmm. uh i think the layman right don't know what to plug into that intuitively but we're you know it involves movies like the anime that i mentioned earlier it mm-hmm. involves movies like the matrix or games like uh bioshock steampunk well, i mean the granddaddy of them all a lot of these cyberpunk shadow run blade runner absolutely that's that's the vein that i honestly don't know if there's too much out there that really will uh, like have such a broad appeal do you see what i mean like usually you're going to find those references uh on kotaku or somewhere that's really where where those fans are going to go i expect with his approach the little bit of time i've spent with him and i've played some virtual fighter with him (laughs) and the man's a competitor you know i i think he the opportunity there is to kind of broaden the appeal to people who might not realize that they're fans of it already Yes, and he'll end up broadening their their scope and giving them more things to watch, more things that maybe they weren't aware of. Whether it's a movie, whether it's a game, a different way to reference and understand. Like his knowledge of, like when we go into game history, and he mm-hmm. knows, you know, habits and traits of the developer, circa wicked smart. That, like this guy, yeah, that, that, that platform. Like when they were developing this game for the N64, it's like impressive. Like the guy knows all of that. Sharp, super sharp. And again, I have to just, just because like it it is a podcast and it is a topic that might like spook some people off a little bit only because they they may not know enough about it, et cetera. But if there was ever a guy that could wrap you up in a hug and bring you along for the ride. And make you feel, yeah, absolutely. Make you feel welcome. Cause he'll tell you all about it because he loves it and he wants you to love it. And he's going to like take you for that ride. Like that. There's no more perfect guy than for him. No, to do this. I, right. I agree with you. I think the thing is, is that the, the words are intimidating to, like I said, if you don't yeah. know, if you don't have a connection to that, it, it sounds, it, it sounds like you don't know, you know, again, you might get a little like, uh, um, I don't know what that means. Maybe that's not, maybe I'm not who they're speaking to. And then you just crack the surface a little bit. You're like, Oh, well, that you know, I, I love that I love oh I don't remember I've seen that oh I love that too you know that's what I end up finding out and then if you give him a chance to talk about it I mean like you said I, I think it's about broadening the scope for people who may not realize that they're a fan of a whole genre that they didn't know the depth and and scope of right he's gonna be there showing us like a, a way to dig into all of it that's exciting and plus let's be honest we're all you know as a society, we're on a roller coaster to a dystopian cyberpunk future. Anyways, people want to just get familiar with it. Uh, yeah, I think so. I think so. Embrace it. Just embrace the future. Just well, so look, suck. let's, let's embrace the retro future. I like that. Very get ready much. for the let's two go. minutes of hate every morning. So, like, it, as a whole, I always want to go through this one by one. We've got rumination from the red room with our guest host. Mitch Proctor. You've got On the Human Experiment with your host, Mike. You've got Record Store Ruminations, Mitch. 
with the host, Ken. Six uh, uh, ruminations of a six button samurai. That's James, correct? Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, Brevity box with myself, Brando. Ruminations of red rum. I'm always gonna call him Kiltrocity, but what's his? <laughs> his name's Kyle. 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 Retro futurist and Kenny. That's what I said. Yeah. I now, retro futurist culture is Hoptimus, and I I just think Hoptimus is all he should call himself. <laughs> yeah. I mean, throughout the whole thing, it should just be Hoptimus. That would be a lot of fun. And even when he put in his bio, it was he referred to himself as Hoptimus. So I think we just keep that uh, anonymity going with the, the Hoptimus. Well, because it, it allows him to build that as a character, right? Oh, yeah. And I think he's got the best platform to probably do that. Yeah. Uh, and then we have Ruminations on Tony's Tall Tales with the host, Anthony. Make you smile. That's, I mean, this is the Ruminations Radio Network, man. This is the the thing that you have inspired to a great extent, whether you like to hear it or not, Mitch. And uh, again, I'm I'm excited to be a part of it. I'm excited just to be a fan of it. Uh, and I'm I'm excited that you sat down with us, man. Thank you for being the first guest. I uh, <laughs> I really appreciate it. I think it's been. A real, uh, you know, eye-opening. I think it lets people know who you are, man, and I hope you Thank agree. You. Um, Brando and I talked about this earlier, and, uh, you know, one of the guys that I've been, when I, I used to watch Inside the Actor Studio, I, uh, and if you didn't, uh, you should Google it. It's really interesting. But uh, the host, James Lipton, was really famous for his questionnaire at the end of his long-form interview on inside the actor studio that he would have with television and movie stars. And he would borrow this list from Brando, the famous French Bernard Pouveau. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Proust, I believe. Proust. Okay. Well, so we're going to, I need to try to learn how to speak French. Mm -hmm. So Mitch, we thought this would be a fun thing to try because it's a fun, (laughs) it's a fun little 10 question thing. Cool. Okay, we're gonna yeah. we're gonna hit and you I'm, up I'm, with it, and then and I'm thinking Charlie needs to make his own weird version of this for the future. So I, I took your advice on that to, to but here's what I think. Ooh. I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna review it and either add, subtract, or edit based on the guest. I like so it. being the, I can, I can the first it. one, I didn't really go too crazy with it. And by the way, uh. If you go out there and find the Cartman South Park uh, joke about this one, uh, oh what is your favorite color is not a question on the original questionnaire. <laughs> and I won't even hit the joke, but you should Google it because it's pretty funny. Five, four, three, All right. Let's let's get started with this. Uh, First question, Mitch. This is going to be easy. What is your favorite word? Ruminations. Ruminations. (laughs) Uh, You know, here's the thing. I believe it, but it's also maybe a very smart play by you. Okay, ruminations. What is your least favorite word? This, these are actually, these are not easy. This is not an easy start. I thought this was going to be easy. He said, oh, it starts easy. That's least you favorite can, word. You're the one making it difficult here. You're thinking <laughs> it. You can shoot right from the hip. What's your least favorite word? Um, I don't know. I don't have a least favorite word. Okay. Don't, words don't really don't, I'm not uncomfortable. COVID. With <laughs> yeah, okay, so, Fair. So COVID. Good. See, that works. Okay, <laughs> let's move on. Uh, what turns you on creatively? Music. What turns you off? Uh, selfishness. What is your favorite curse word? Uh, punk ass. Why punk ass? I, I don't know. I mean, there are a lot that I use more than that, but I just, I like that one. I just like the ring. <laughs> you know, like... Like punk well, maybe, ass. Yeah, punk ass. <laughs> I like it too, punk ass. I got to use that more now. I like. The, I become a. I like I've become a real big. I become a real big fan of bitch made. <laughs> <laughs> bitch made. Yeah, that's that's unique. All right. Yeah. Okay. 
I like miach. That's my favorite curse word. I take it back. Miach. <laughs> miach. Okay, miach. All right. What sound or noise do you love? Oh, what sound or noise? Uh, I love the sound of thunder. All right. And what sound or noise do you hate? I hate the sound of silence. All right. And here is the one question I added just for Mitch. This is the one thing I added differently. If you could, what era of time in history would you most like to live in? Oh, man, I really want to talk about this because we did a podcast a ways back with the Red Room, and then we gave it to a doctor friend, uh, and she analyzed it. And came back with some interesting comments on the people that were guesting on that show, including myself. And wow, yeah, it was really it was really interesting and kind of eye opening. Um, my, if I could live in any time, and we're sub, you know minusing you know living in the sixties, hanging out with Jim Morrison, and you know if you just kind of like subtracting some of those things, I would love to live in a time that is something similar to the fictional world of of Tolkien or at least in the old West, the frontier where, where you just were working with your hands, building, taking care of your own. And, uh, you know, that, that life was simpler and you were just trying not to get eaten by bears. Like I, there's something about that that I really like. That's a really interesting answer, man. I, I, I thought you would, I thought maybe you would go with the, uh, the sixties, right? That was, thought- that's my fun answer. Right. Okay. Yeah. And then I and then I thought maybe maybe it was going to be like roaring 20s era. <laughs> I Just can cause the, yeah. you know cuz the the time that's when jazz is really starting yeah. to pump out, right? And there's there's a lot of changing yeah, going on. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought maybe that frontier totally uh it makes sense, but not not what I expected, man, for sure. Can I share with you what she determined uh, about myself from that podcast and my oh, answer please to do. it? Please do. Yeah, please do. Yeah. And that absolutely. was one of the answers, one of the questions we discussed, and she referenced that. And I think Charlie will appreciate this from the early episodes of The Red Room. Uh, she said uh, clearly that I was looking for meaning. And that's why I wanted to live in a time like that, which reminded me of Charlie and his turn of phrase, mining for meaning. And that that's what we were doing in the red room is that we were mining for meaning. And I thought, wow, look at that come full circle and uh, make a lot of sense. Wow. That's uh, I didn't know that, man. Did that's any crazy. of your guests do the, I want to live right now cop out and get an analysis? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> Nobody wants to live now. Nobody wants to live now. <laughs> I don't want to go back to a time before Google maps. Okay. Not real maps. <laughs> Where you actually have to read topography. Yeah, I don't want to go back to that either. Yeah. All right, uh, Mitch, we got yeah, we got uh, two more. One, here we go. We what all the questions? Two more questions. What job or profession would you not want to try? Um, would I not want to try? Yeah. What's the one job or profession that you were like, I couldn't do it. I just. That's something I I'm, I I could never do. I don't know, proctologist. Oh well, that just makes a lot of alliteration fun with your last name. I know, and so I I really <laughs> I'm doing, I heard it my whole life. So yeah, I was a kid once. <laughs> okay, okay. So we'll move on to the last question, and I actually have an edit on this question myself, but I'm going to ask you the real question first. All right, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive? How was the ride? How was the ride? Deep. Like, if I have a personal sit down with God, if that's what you're talking about, like I get there and like he is, because he's all powerful. So he can make the time to greet each person who dies and makes it to heaven. And well, he time's not down. a thing there. Yeah, time's not a thing. So he's he sits me down and we have our coffee. And the first thing he asks is like, so how was the ride? Like, was that the ride? would be, that'd be what I'd want him to say. I like that. Okay, so my edit on that question would be... When I go to hell, what's the devil going to say to me? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think the devil's going to say? My edit on that question was this. If heaven exists, when you arrive, 
what song is playing in the background? Ooh, Ooh that's a good one. Uh, the Doors, the Alabama song. Wow. That's a solid answer, man. <laughs> Mitch, this is... Yeah, Dalvin of the Chamber. Is this is my... This is the end of our first interview. You've been really fun to have as a guest. And I, I, I can't tell you how how great this was, the questionnaire. And I hope everybody sees you a little more clearly, maybe a little more like I do or like we do. Uh, thanks for being a guest on the show. Thanks for being a part of this. Thanks for getting everything going and being inspiring with Ruminations Radio Network and keeping your podcast going and having us on. Um, it's it's really great, and I'm excited, man. Thank you for being here. Thanks Thank again. You. Thank you, Appreciate man. It much. Really, oh, no, man, I... Thank you guys for having me on. I mean, I, I felt very, uh, very trepidatious and, uh, but very flattered that you would, that you'd want me to do your episode here, man. So thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. Thank it's you. been a lot of fun. It's been, I think that it's a, a great time. <laughs> yeah, it's a good time. Well, I'm going to have, have a bad. It's been fun. I have many plans for you to be back in different capacities. And, uh, you know, Brando, I think, uh, mm. Dude, I think we got some magic here. Uh, do you want to say anything before we sign off? No, I mean, it's our our inaugural episode. I don't think we could have had a better guest. And uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm quite pleased. I'm looking forward to our future endeavors. Me too. And listen, everybody or every person or just the one person who might listener, listener, listeners, uh, you know, I hope you join us for uh, everything that we might grow into all of us together and uh, really thank you for listening and joining us on brevity box. And uh, I can't wait for episode two, you know, subscribe and you'll keep getting them uh, right in your face. Thanks again. I hope everybody has a good night. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the brevity box brought to you by ruminations radio network. If you like this cast or want to find some other great topics, join me, Hoptimus, on the Retro Futurist Culture Podcast for great discussions on all things retro future. Check it out at RuminationsRadioNetwork.com.